Inside our body, we have all these different types of cells, trillions of cells. And these cells carry out these biochemical processes. And many of these biochemical processes exist in every single cell of our body. For instance, glycolysis takes place in every single cell of our body. Now, we know that we have many different types of cells and many different types of tissues. And what that means is these different types of cells, even though they carry out the same type of process, for instance, glycolysis, the requirements for those biochemical processes in the different types of cells actually might be different. And so what that means is our cells must also be able to closely, uh, closely regulate these biochemical processes and fine tune those regulatory pathways to actually meet the needs and demands of those specific types of cells. And one way by which our body is able to actually regulate and fine tune these specific biochemical processes in the different types of cells in our body is by using molecules known as isozymes or isoenzymes. And we actually discussed many examples of isozymes previously. For instance, when we discussed the regulatory pathway of glycolysis in skeletal muscle cells and liver cells, we said that pyruvate kinase, the enzyme that catalyzes the final step in glycolysis that we find in skeletal muscle cells and in liver cells actually come in different forms. In muscle cells, we have predominantly the M isozyme, but in liver cells, we have predominantly that L isozyme of pyruvate kinase. And although they carry out the same type of catalytic and regulatory uh, process, they do have slightly different properties. And that's because they have slightly different amino acid sequences and slightly different structures. So we see that isozymes are proteins that carry out the same type of biochemical process, but have slightly different amino acid sequences and slightly different structures. And so because of that, they display slightly different properties. For instance, they might have different Michaelis constant values. They might have different turnover numbers and so forth. Now, these isozymes allow our body to actually fine tune these regulatory pathways to actually meet the needs and demands of all the different types of cells that exist inside our body. Now, what I'd like to focus on in this lecture is the biochemical process by which we actually bring the glucose molecules into the cells of our body. So, Remember, glucose molecules have many polar groups. They have many hydroxyl groups, and that makes glucose a polar molecule. And so what that means is, even if we have a concentration gradient that exists across the cell membrane, because the membrane is predominantly nonpolar hydrophobic, these polar glucose molecules and sugar molecules cannot make their way across the cell membrane. And so the cells create these transmembrane proteins that contain 12 transmembrane alpha helices that we call glucose transporters and these allow the movement allow the shuttling of these glucose molecules across the cell membrane so essentially upon the binding of the glucose molecule or other monosaccharide onto the glucose transporter a conformational change takes place that allows the movement of that glucose or other monosaccharide into the cytoplasm of that cell. So let's suppose we have a high concentration of glucose in the blood plasma, a low amount in the inside the cell and so the glucose will move down its concentration gradient from the outside to the inside. So inside our body to be able to fine tune the regulation of this biochemical process, we basically depend on different types of isozymes of glucose transporters. And in fact, we have over 10 different isozymes of glucose transporters. And in this lecture, we're going to focus on the first five, perhaps the, mo uh, the most important of these glucose transporter molecules. So we have GLUT1, GLUT2, GLUT3, GLUT4, and GLUT5, where GLUT basically stands for glucose transporter.
let's begin with GLUT1 and GLUT3. Now, GLUT1 as well as GLUT3 are actually responsible for establishing something called the basal rate of glucose uptake. So what exactly is the basal rate of glucose uptake? Well, it's basically the rate at which these glucose molecules are continually being taken up by the cell even when our body is at rest because our cells essentially always require these glucose molecules to create ATP molecules to carry out all the different types of processes because just because we're at rest that doesn't mean our cells aren't actually carrying out these processes. So we find these GLUT1 molecules essentially in all the cells of our body but these cells, these uh, GLUT1 membrane proteins predominate in the membranes of red blood cells while the GLUT3 predominate in the membranes of neurons found in the brain. So we find them on dendrites as well as on axons of neurons found in the brain. Now, both of these glucose transporters, GLUT1 and GLUT3, basically have a relatively low Km value. Now, before we talk about that, let's define what the concentration of glucose is normally in our blood. So, the blood glucose levels are maintained at around a value of 5 millimolar. That's the concentration. And the Km value of these two transporters is around 1 millimolar. Now, notice that, first of all, it's lower than the 5, than the normal amount in our blood. And before we discuss what that actually means, let's remember what a Km value actually tells us. So, the Km is simply the Michaelis constant. And the Km value basically tells us the concentration at which exactly half of the active sites of that particular enzyme are actually filled. And that gives us the velocity value that is exactly half of the maximum velocity value. And because the Km value is much lower than the 5 millimolar value, what that means is these are very effective at binding those glucose molecules and transporting those glucose molecules across the cell. So because of the low Km values of these two glucose transporters, we see that when we have a 5 millimolar concentration of blood glucose, which is the normal one, these molecules are continually shuttling and moving these glucose molecules down their concentration gradient. So, once again, GLUT1 is the glucose transporter that we find all over our body in all different types of cells, and we find them predominantly in the membranes of red blood cells, and these are responsible, along with the help of GLUT3, for generating the basal rate of glucose uptake. So, we see that blood glucose levels are maintained at a value of around 5 millimolar concentration, but the Km value of GLUT1 as well as GLUT3 is around 1 millimolar. And what that means is they have a very high affinity for the substrate molecule, the glucose, and under these normal blood concentrations of glucose, these two transporters are continually on and they're continually moving these glucose molecules down their concentration gradient. Now, let's talk a bit about, let's talk a bit more about the GLUT3. So, the GLUT3 are these molecules that also generate the basal uptake rate, but we also find them predominantly in the nerve cells found inside our brain, in the neurons. We find them in the membrane of the dendrites as well as the axons of the nerve cells of the brain. Now, why is it important that we have a high concentration of these GLUT3 in the brain? Well, because the brain cells depend on glucose molecules and the brain cells are arguably some of the most important cells in our body and they need to get that glucose first before any other cell actually gets the glucose. And so that's why they have a high concentration of the GLUT3 because this has a Km value around 1 that makes it very, very effective in binding that glucose and bringing that glucose into the cytoplasm of the nerve cells. Now, let's move on to GLUT3, GLUT4, and GLUT5. And let's imagine that we just ingested a meal that is high in carbohydrates and what that basically means is the blood level of glucose will essentially rise. And what will begin to happen is
the beta cells of our pancreas of the islets of Langerhans will begin to produce insulin. And what allows those cells, the beta cells of the pancreas, to actually sense this increase in the glucose levels in the blood are these GLU2 protein membrane. So these transporters are typically found in the pancreas, so the beta cells of the pancreas that release the insulin as well as the liver, and we also find them in the basolateral membrane of things like the kidneys as well as our intestines. And so these membrane proteins, unlike these two, actually have a relatively large KM value of 15 nanometers. Now, why is that physiologically significant? Well, what that basically means is the liver cells and the pancreas cells will only begin to uptake the glucose molecules and will only begin to sense the presence of these glucose molecules if the blood levels rise. And this only happens after we actually eat a meal rich in carbohydrates. So after we eat that carbohydrate rich meal, the blood glucose levels will rise and that will allow these GLU2 to actually sense that increase in glucose levels because they have a KM value that is high. So they're not as effective in binding the glucose as these two other molecules. And that's important because they don't need to be effective because it's the brain cells and muscle cells of our body that need that glucose more than the liver cells. And so once we eat, it's these liver cells that begin to secrete the insulin and the insulin, as we'll see in just a moment, actually goes on and affects GLUT4. So let's finish with GLUT2. So this implies that because they have a high KM value, they have a low affinity for the glucose substrate molecules and will only uptake the glucose at high blood glucose levels. So after we eat a carbohydrate rich meal. Now let's move on to GLUT4. So GLUT4 we actually find in our muscle cells and adipose tissue, so fat cells of our body. And the KM value of these transporters is around 5 millimolar. So it's not as low as these two and it's not as high as this. And actually, these GLUT4 membrane proteins are sensitive to the insulin. So the insulin is able to actually stimulate these muscle cells and adipose tissue cells, so fat cells, to express more of these GLUT4 on the membrane of these cells. And once they express more of these GLUT4, they able, they're able to actually uptake all those glucose molecules from the blood plasma following the ingestion of that carbohydrate-rich meal. So, GLUT4 are found in the cells of muscle and adipose tissue. They have a KM value, the Michaelis constant of about 5 millimolar and respond to insulin. And following food ingestion, muscle and fat cells express many more GLUT4 membrane proteins to assist with glucose uptake. So we essentially ingest that food, our glucose levels basically rise and the rise in glucose levels allow the liver cells and our kidney cells and other cells to basically uptake that glucose as a result of the action of this GLU2. And the pancreas cells also uptake the glucose, sensing that glucose increase, and so the pancreas releases the insulin, which goes on to stimulate the muscle cells and fat cells to begin basically expressing more of these GLU4 to uptake more of those glucose molecules to essentially bring that glucose level in the blood back to normal, back to a value of about 5 millimolar. And finally, I'd also like to mention GLUT5 because GLUT5 is actually responsible for uptaking the fructose monosaccharides that we find in the small intestine following a carbohydrate rich meal. So GLUT5 is found predominantly on the apical side of the small intestine cells and these are responsible for actually uptaking those fructose monosaccharide molecules from the lumen of the small intestine. So we see that this individual process of taking up the glucose molecules into the cell is very important and must take place in every single cell of our body. But because different cells basically have different requirements, we must be able to fine tune this process to meet the, the, need, uh, to meet the, uh, to meet the needs of those specific cells. And that's where these different isozymes actually come into play.